Okay, everyone. Good, uh, good afternoon. Good evening, uh, Jose. Good night to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome, everyone, on behalf of Tilbury House Publishers and Whitaker Enterprises, as we launch this wonderful book, starting over in Central in Sunset Park. We're delighted the publisher and creators can be with us today. Uh, if we haven't met, I'm Bruce Whitaker, and I'll be your host as we explore this lovely book which is for readers six to eight and all ages above and below that. If you haven't already, please go to our friends at Book Culture. I'm going to put their link in the uh, chat and uh, you can go there uh, to purchase it. Either they have branches all over the city if you're out and about or that you can order it online. So um, I'm putting that here. Uh, now this is, okay, just a moment, please. I'll, uh, sorry, I'll do that in a minute anyway. So, um, as I said, I'm a friend of Jose's and Lynn's and uh, my, by way of background, I've worked primarily in fundraising and producing in theater, but deep in my career as a stint at Harper Bracey Bonavitch, a publishing company. So books have always been very important to me. And as we've worked on putting this event together, it's been my pleasure to meet Jonathan and Bianca, who you'll meet shortly. Oh, uh, really enjoyed preparing for that. So mm -hmm. let's get started. We'll have a brief conversation with the folks behind the book, and then we'll have time for a Q&A at the end. So until then, please do uh, keep your uh, keep yourself muted, and um, here come uh, Lynn and Jose. So, Lynn's poetry books include Tracks and Sober Cooking and two award-winning chapbooks. Twice a Pushcart nominee, she's also a Best of the Net Award nominee and winner of the McDowell Fellowship and Judith's Room Emerging Writers Award. Starting over in Sunset Park is her first children's book. Jose Pelez founded Kitty in New York, an agency that provides temporary homes to the pets of traveling New Yorkers, and it plays a key role in our book. Starting over in Sunset Park explores issues he himself experienced while adjusting to life in America. And I might add, he's joining us today from Madrid. So welcome both of you. And uh, can we start by just asking, uh, how did you find out about, uh, how did you meet each other and, and uh, where did you meet and under what circumstances? Mm. I found a kid in New York in 2012 and I had to find people who loved cats but didn't have any pets, which was not easy. <laughs> so I set up an ad in Craigslist and I had to visit each of them to make sure they met uh, the, the qualities that I was looking for. So Lynn contacted me and she gave me an appointment to meet at a diner close to her home because she didn't trust me. <laughs> <laughs> so when we went there, she asked me for my ID and finally I got to her home <laughs> and I found her ideal for the work. <laughs> and then we became friends as only and I found out she was a writer. And um, the idea came after a few years on the line uh, of meeting so many different people. And she was the perfect match for me because she was a writer, she knew how to do it. And I told her about it and she was very excited immediately. And we started working on it. Um, and I mixed up my, <clears throat> my background as the agency manager and all the experience I had um, after being a foreign exchange student in Missouri when I was 16 and I didn't understand anything that the teachers told me at the school. Um, I, got in, I got to Missouri in August and I think I didn't understand a thing until after Christmas. So, uh, and that's in the book. <laughs> and uh, it was very easy working with her. It was, she's, she's a very good friend of mine right now and I'm glad we met. Lynn, and that's something. <laughs> okay. Lynn, what's, yeah. what's your side of the story? Well, he's right. We met at a diner. I demanded ID. <laughs> the ID, because he was going to go to my apartment and check out my apartment. And uh, then we, I was 
clearly, I obviously I knew, you know, could tell he wasn't going to murder me. So, um, <laughs> and, <laughs> although he probably felt like it years later once we were friends, but um, no, we, it was really helpful over the years to have the cats as, and, and to take care of them. Um, when I went through a really hard time and taking care of other people's beloved pet and making sure it felt safe and happy, you know, got me out of my own pitiful pity party, you know, when I was going through a hard time and, um, and, you know, that's, that's it. And then I, you know, I just thought, you know, and then I started to think about, um, that that theme of taking care of you know the, the how the cats can pass through your life and um how you know a child might have that experience if they were new to new york and at first we we thought about you know like we wanted it to be and i told jose about the idea and i asked him if he wanted to co-write the book with me um sunset park was is a beautiful neighborhood in brooklyn and jose had just moved there and I was in love with the neighborhood. I actually tried to move there myself and Jose was showing me apart. We were looking at, he was helping me look at apartments and there's a scene in the book where they're looking at an apartment and the, she, the mom says, I thought you said it was two bedrooms and the realtor says, it is if you put the wall back up. <laughs> so we actually had that experience where I went to look at a, an apartment with Jose and um, to buy for myself and uh, that happened. So, you know, little things like that from our friendship made it into the book. So, Jose, what are some of the other real life episodes that made it into the book that you ran into? Well, the neighbor that does, that works on the Muppet faces, um, that's a real caregiver that I met. Yeah. He actually lives in the East Village. And when I went to the apartment, the whole room was full of Muppet heads. One of them was of Donald Trump, and he just worked on that. And then another person I met, uh, he told me that he worked in a factory in Sunset Park, creating Christmas decoration all year long. And they will set them up in businesses in New York. And during the year, they will redo them and fix them and create new ones. And that's also in the book. And then the basic, uh, how the agency works, it's also portrayed in the book. We look for people who don't have any pets, who love cats, but would like to have a cat for uh, for a few weeks or a few months, and that's how that's how we work. We have over 500 caregivers in New York right now, and it's a city where there are a lot of, of expats who who okay. move to the city for a few yeah. years. They get a cat and they don't know what to do when they have to go back to their countries or when they go on vacation, and that's how that's how they manage. They contact us and we put them in in touch with someone else who lives nearby, uh, who's gonna take care of the cat. And that's, all that is in the book. <laughs> yeah. Now, what was it like, what was your process like in writing? Uh, we've talked about, you have these elements from life coming together, you have this idea for a book. Um, so how did the actual writing take place? Well, everybody's so busy in New York. that um, time is very expensive. <laughs> everybody's busy. So uh, Lynn works, uh, a regular uh, office hours. So uh, I would go to her workplace downtown. She works very close to the World Trade Center. And we would go to Whole Foods that's nearby. There is a big cafeteria with nice Wi-Fi, very nice place to meet. And we would meet there and work on the project. We would do that every few weeks. And slowly the whole thing came together. And then we were so lucky to meet um, Jonathan <laughs> by email, and he made it real. <laughs> I'll tell you how we found Tilbury, if you want to know. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. So I did a Google search for children's book publishers that take unagented books without an agent and unsolicited. And there are some, you know, there's a, there, so I, and I picked 10. And I remember that. yeah, remember it was like, yeah, I, I sent it to 10 places. You know? So I sent a pitch that was, uh, you know, just a you know, story summary. And I kind of pitched us and things in our background, you know, that related to the story. And Tilbury showed an interest right away. And, you know, Jose and I were, were like screaming on the phone to each other. We were so excited. 
and mm -hmm. uh, you know, then we signed a contract and that's it. Now, you mentioned, Lynn, that you wrote this as a graphic novel, and we're gonna talk a lot about pictures because they're such an, a key part of the book. What sorts of, uh, as a writer working with text and your experience that, what sorts of uh, new experiences was working with an illustrated book from your perspective? Well, I mean, brainstorming with Jose, he's extremely visual. So he kept coming up with setting, he kept coming up with visuals. And in the graphic novel um, format, you, you have like one comma one, which would be like one scene and part one of one scene. And uh, you, so, and you suggest the visuals in, 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 that, in that outline. So as we worked on it, and I'm like furiously typing, we brainstormed on dialogue and uh, you know, the visuals and that's just part of a graphic novel format. And I was so happy that Tilbury, you know, kind of, you know, as Jonathan described it as kind of a hybrid um, graphic novel slash picture book. Um, I'm so happy that they did it that way. I think they, you know, I say, I think one of you, it might've been, I don't know if it was Tristan or John, Jonathan said to, he said, you know, we've never seen anything like this. We are just scratching our heads and then, I'm sure nobody sent you a, I, I, I never stopped to, it didn't occur to me to go online and say, what, what's the format for a children's book? I just did it with what I knew. Um, and anyway. And I know that all of you, the uh, Bianca and all of you worked really hard to make this as authentic and Domin to a Dominican person as possible. What are some of the research you did to feed the uh, illustration process? Oh. Well, uh, I was lucky to have another friend that I met in New York. Um, he's a um, Uber driver from the Dominican Republic. He moved to New York when he was 20 years old, and he was the perfect person to help us with that. Um, and Lynn got in touch with him, and we tried to give all the information to Bianca. And she did a wonderful job because she lives in Brooklyn and she visited Sunset Park. And when I first saw the illustrations, I was moved. I live very close to Fifth Avenue and all the businesses are there with the Spanish names on them. <laughs> and she portrayed that perfectly in a very beautiful way, very colorful way. Yeah. So we thank you, Bianca. some of these pages later in our program today, yeah. Yeah, we really appreciate it. I mean, I appreciate, I'll just speak for myself, but I know Jose did too. We really appreciated um, how determined Bianca was to make the um, illustrations reflect a child's memory of having lived in the Dominican. And since neither of us are, are from the DR, um, you know, it, it, I, it, and Bianca isn't either. It really, I was really impressed that she tried so hard to make sure there were elements that a child from the DR would recognize as having been in their home. And I, I talked at length with um, a professor at the college where I work who specializes in uh, Dominican culture. And she gave me a, you know, a lot of ideas and visuals. And then we, and we talked to Julio, you know, like every, he would take breaks on his Uber and, uh, and call me at work and I would take more notes from him and then he would go back to work and then he would take a break and call me. So, and we would send all this to Jonathan who, who would send it to Bianca. But I felt like we worked really closely with Bianca even though we didn't work directly. Great. Okay, folks, thank you very much. We're going to move on to another part of the conversation now, but Jose and Lynn, congratulations so much. And uh, we'll be back to you a little bit later. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Thank, thank you for you. organizing. Now, thank you. Now we have gone out to some specialists to get some special comment about this book. And we're about to hear from our first one. Um, this is Anna. Uh, give me a moment, and she's coming in um, online. Here you go. Hi, my name is Anne, and I will be reviewing Starting Over in Sunset Park. This book is about a girl and her mother moving from the Dominican Republic to Sunset Park. This story also includes how the struggles of the, that comes with fitting in in Sunset Park. One thing I like about this book is that they include very, very, 
very good illustrations, and they also include lots of color. Also, another thing I like is that at the end of the book, they have a map that shows you where Sunset Park is, so you can identify it. Finally, I like how they trans how they turn how when the character speaks Spanish, they translate it to English so we can understand it. So, thank you very much, Anna. Uh, so we'll uh, go on to our next guest this evening, and we're very happy he's with us. Is Jonathan Eaton, the publisher of Tilbury Press, and uh, we'll uh, go through some questions with you. So. Thank you very much, Jonathan, and welcome. Thank you. So let me just give a quick background. Jonathan retired from McGraw-Hill in 2010 after a 29-year career publishing boating and outdoor adventure books. He purchased Tilbury House Publishers with former McGraw-Hill colleague Tris Coburn in 2013 and immersed himself in the craft of publishing children's books. He believes that a children's book writer, like a jazz musician, can make familiar themes sound entirely new with creative phrasing and as Miles Davis said, by listening for what to leave out. So Jonathan, I wanna to jump to that last part of your bio. Uh, what to leave out, what does artwork, how do they interact in a book like this? And as a person kind of pulling together the words and the pictures, what's, what, what do you look for and how does that work? <laughs> wow. Uh, <clears throat> well, as Lynn had mentioned, the manuscript when it first came to us was written in, in graphic novel format. So there were these one comma ones and two comma twos and, and Tris and I read through that and thought, what is this? And, you know, we, we, we kind of figured out, okay, this is set up as a graphic nonfiction. We really would like to and need to get it into a picture book format but we're gonna to have to wind up in a, in a hybrid sort of between picture book because there are scenes that move through multiple sub scenes and you really need to have multiple panels on a page. And then we had to wrestle with when is the dialogue gonna be in talk balloons and when is it gonna be in quote marks in a narrative text? All these things had to be worked out uh, and Lynn and Jose were very patient and, and very good with that process. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if this was, I can't remember if this was part of your question, Bruce, but we, we then went looking for an illustrator and we wanted an illustrator who could give this, I, I, I loved uh, uh, Anna's review just now because we wanted an illustrator who could give us uh, vibrant colors, authentic, uh, Sunset Park neighborhood street scenes and a, a, a sort of greater New York context for the story. And all those, and those were all conscious decisions. We worked with those and uh, we were very fortunate to find Bianca. She, she gave us all of that. And uh, to circle back to your question, a picture book is called a picture book because the illustrations are sharing the narrative burden with the text. So you don't want pictures that simply repeat what the text is already saying. The pictures should be extending the story, adding another dimension, making it a richer story. And it, it, they can do it in this case by the uh, attitudes of the cats, the various places the cats are hiding in different pictures the uh, neighborhood elements that Bianca pulled into it, the cultural elements that she pulled into it. Um, all of that takes a great deal of effort for an illustrator to uh, round up and she did a great job with it. Well, I will be seeing that as I said, and I totally agree with you. What are some of the aspects about children's books that, that attracted you? You'd worked on other genre in your own publishing career before this. Why children's books? Well, uh, we, we, we sort of landed here by accident. We bought a small uh, main based uh, uh, publisher and they had, uh, you know, approximately 50-50 children's books and adult regional books. 
And we realized in the first couple of years of uh, working at the list that the books we were enjoying most were the children's books. And uh, uh, Tris uh, was becoming a, uh, a parent of a blended family of four kids at about that time. I was becoming a grandparent at about that time. And as, so we were both at different stages in our lives that uh, uh, made the children's books particularly relevant. And, you know, we began to feel, um, yeah, we, we just lived through a tumultuous four or five years in case you hadn't noticed. <laughs> And uh, we began to feel that, you know, children's books can have an impact and uh, we can do some things in children's books. And we had several immigrant stories already when we saw Lynn and Jose's uh, manuscript. And so we were predisposed to like it. Um, and uh, so I, I guess that's the answer to your question. Yeah, I like that cause element in children's books. The back of this book has uh, websites for immigration resources and causes. And I know in other books you built extensions for classroom or other kinds of sharing, so. Yeah. Yes, we try to reach the bookstore marketplace and we try to reach classrooms and libraries as well. Mm -hmm. So what else was in your catalog in broad terms right now and what are you looking for? Where are the gaps that you would love to see a manuscript uh, your door. Uh, you know, we throw around ideas. We have internal um, uh, editorial meetings, and uh, the 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 you know the four or five of us uh, sit around and uh, brainstorm ideas. And right now, we're all working from home, have been since March of 2020. But when we're in the office, it's almost like uh, milk and cookies back in elementary school. We we get coffee, we get sandwiches, and we start reading stories out loud that have come to us by one path or another. And we brainstorm ideas of books that we'd love to do. Um, one idea that uh, we came up with was, could be called um, Their Heroes Too. And it would be a book about people, you know, driving cabs, um, checking out groceries, working in hair salons, uh, teachers, people in all walks of life doing the jobs that they do well and with a good heart and extending the sort of idea of who is a hero uh, mm -hmm. to include all the people who make the world go round. And uh, we have a book on our back list called Good uh, Before We Eat. And it occurred to us that the author of that book would be a, a great author for uh, They Could Be Heroes too. And so that's, you know, we come up with ideas in house and, and uh, sometimes and go looking for the authors for those books. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned a little bit about what, about starting over in Sunset Park caught your attention. Do you wanna say anything more about uh, what sort of struck you as the manuscript came across your desk? Well, the central notion that uh, animals and, and the human animal, the human pet interaction uh, can be very helpful as people navigate their own lives. And the idea that our central character, the narrator, uh, realizes uh, by way of the cats that they're taking care of, that if they can adapt to this, if they can get through this change and, and you know, adapt, so can I. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just thought that was a great, uh, uh, just a great central concept for a children's book. Super. Now you, um, generally, I understand children's publishers do the matching work of scripts or text to illustrator. And we, you talked earlier about Bianca getting connected to the story. Um, how do you find illustrators and what particularly, what else do you want to say about Bianca as being part of the project? Well, typically what we do is we start uh, looking online uh, at illustrators' portfolios. And uh, uh, so all those illustrators out there having a website with your portfolio available online uh, is very definitely a good marketing tool to use. Um, 
in Bianca's case, I think we found her through a connection of a connection. Um, you know, I can no longer ex remember the exact precise way that we found her. Um, but we knew we wanted somebody who could bring a vivid uh, color palette and somebody who could bring uh, sort of Brooklyn Sunset Park based authenticity uh, to the book. It, it had to be, we wanted, we wanted a book that people who live in that neighborhood could look at and say, oh yeah, I know where that is. I recognize this. Um, and uh, Bianca, you know, f fortunately uh, was willing to work with us. And uh, we did it through the pandemic. And, you know, uh, Jose, I don't know where Jose is right now while we're doing this Zoom. Uh, I'm in Madrid. I'm in Madrid. He's in Madrid. Spain, so, yes. uh, Bruce, as you mentioned, I've been in this business a long time. And doing a book uh, 35, 40 years ago where people were living all over the world, it was almost impossible because everything you did, you had to do in hard copy and you had to send it off via uh, FedEx or UPS and, uh, or US mail and wait weeks to get a response. And the internet has completely revolutionized this process. It's just amazing. Now in, in working with Bianca, she still had to send her uh, original illustrations to us so that we could get them scanned and turn them into digital files. And uh, so Bianca could probably tell you that there were you know, lots of uh, last minute uh, rush visits to FedEx to get things into the, into the post, but it worked. Well, good. Well, congratulations, Jonathan. We're going to move on to our next section to talk to Bianca. Who's, we've all been talking about her and she'll have a chance to speak for herself. But first, I want to share another critic's opinion. So stand by here, folks. Hey, Priya. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. So what did you think of the book, Starting Over in Sunset Park? I thought it was really good. I loved it. It was amazing. And if I were you, I'd read it. <laughs> what did you like about it? I liked the pictures. They were really beautiful. And they kind of look like some of my drawings or paintings when I draw. And that's one thing I like about it. Another thing is that I like that when she was having a hard time learning English and her teacher and her neighbor told her that they, were, they went through the same thing when they moved from their country to New York. And that made her feel a lot better and less homesick. Yeah. So who would you recommend this book to? I would recommend it to anyone, basically. But mostly I would recommend, well, the most I would recommend it to people that are moving from a different country to New York because it would make them feel less homesick and better. Because they would know other people went through the same thing, right? Yeah. And there's a lot of immigrants in New York <laughs> City. Yep, there's so many, I can't count all of them. <laughs> well, thanks, thanks, Priya. Thanks, bye. So that was Priya, and uh, we thank her for her insights into the, uh, the project and uh, We'll move on now to uh, Bianca. Um, I need to get to, uh, give me a second here, folks. To, Bianca has fallen to there. Okay. And sorry, Jonathan, I'm gonna take you off so you can uh, relax. So Bianca Diaz, welcome. Uh, Bianca is a granddaughter of Mexican immigrants who grew up in Pilsen, a Mexican American neighborhood in Chicago. She was a 2018 Ezra Jack Keats, uh, new illustrator honor recipient for her book, One Day House. So Bianca, welcome again. And how did you hear about the book? And um, 
Do you have anything to add to what Jonathan said about getting brought onto the project in the first place? Hi, everyone. Just want to say thanks for being here. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, getting brought onto the project, I think um, I just got an email basically and read the manuscript and was excited about it. So I just um, agreed to do it. It's, I mean, that was kind of it. <laughs> okay. And what were the challenges and opportunities? What drew you to the project and what were some of your challenges in carrying it out? Uh, what drew me to it was just the story of a neighborhood and these people moving to this neighborhood. I think a lot of my artwork um, focuses kind of on like buildings and communities and neighborhoods. So I thought that um, this was a good story to kind of show uh, those things in my artwork. And I just really liked um, kind of the story of immigrating. Um, it's like a kind of on both sides of my family, like they, everyone came from Mexico um, in my grandparents, like, um, era, I guess, and uh, just, um, I guess I, it was kind of an opportunity to just learn more about them and that experience and um, kind of connect that to this story about this young girl experiencing mm -hmm. that. And you, uh, these are actual drawings, paintings, they're not some sort of uh, graphic design done through computer, they're handmade works. Yeah. Yeah, that was another challenge, just like the quick turnaround time. Um, usually I take about a year to make a book that's uh, 32 pages, which is like typical. And this one was 40 and in six months. So that was a very crazy time for me. <laughs> but it was also the pandemic. So it, I was very busy, uh, which was good in yeah. that time. Um, I want to um, bring up the manuscript now of the, uh, the book and walk through a couple illustrations so we can finally give everyone an idea of what we've been talking about. So stay, bear with me here. Uh, sorry, I'm going to have to start this again. So, um, Here we are, and I think uh, we we're going to talk, first of all, um, the book has these wonderful end papers, and um, I wonder if you could kind of talk a little bit about though the intention of the, uh, which is the side here with the people in the window, and this is also echoed in the, the back cover of the book. Yeah, so uh, I think these were, ki I kind of thought of these towards the end of um, sketching everything out, if I remember correctly. Um, I just, you know, finished envisioning the story. And then I realized that um, besides the beginning of the story, you don't really get to see Jessica, the little girl, um, interact with her family again at the end of the book, or just kind of, you know, after she's gone through this kind of traumatic experience, like, then she's okay, like, by the end, but you don't get to see her, like, enjoy that, like, that feeling of peace with her family, um, which I think is so important. Um, so I just wanted to show that, like that, that was one of the ways that the text didn't necessarily say it, but there was a chance to show it um, and just show them like being a family. And uh, like I used the, kind of the motif of connection through like the cell phones and like calling each other. And the grandma has like a, one of the old time telephones. Uh, in the Dominican Republic and just like showing their connection to each other. Very nice. Is there another drawing you want me to turn to? Uh, yeah, if we're just talking about um, where the pictures can show kind of some things that the text doesn't, um, I think maybe the one besides that one, um, the one where we see um, the studio of the uh, Mr. Palmieri. Yes. So um, he makes these uh, Puerto Rican vejigante masks and um, I tried to do a lot of research, um, not only in how they look like traditionally, and then there's also like some of these designs aren't like uh, as traditional. I think uh, I wanted to get like the, the range of things that I saw in my research. Um, 
but I wa like looked for YouTube videos of um, people who actually make these masks. Um, like um, Miguel Caravaggio was uh, kind of the person I was inspired by for this character. He's like um, a well-known uh, Vejigante mask maker. Um, and so I, um, in this research, just saw like how he does it. And I found it very interesting. Um, and so I just like, it doesn't say it in the text how he does it, but in the picture, you can see like uh, the, how it starts as like paper and, you know, you cut it and there's like um, how the horns are made. Like you might, you, he like twists it around a mold and then like cuts the edges to feather them out. So that's, how, and then you glue it on. So there's that little like glue tub. Um, yeah, so that was just like another thing just to show yeah. behind the scenes. And I think Jonathan wanted us to make sure and show um, a little bit of magic here that you did on this thread in Central Park. Yeah. Yeah, that was a fun one. I went to Central Park in, uh, around when I was doing this page um, just to take pictures and kind of composited things together and just uh, wanted to capture that experience of snow and how it kind of is like a magical experience. Mm. And this was Jessica's first experience of snow, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is always the peak experience. Uh, how terrific. And here, the mother works in a holiday supply manufacturer. Um, so here the, is the 4th of July <laughs> season. So Yeah. And I one of the notes that I got um, from Jose and Lynn's friend was that, um, like, I think it was either from him or from my own research, but it was like uh, Dominican Americans are very proud of both the Dominican Republic and the United States and they'll display the flag together like in their home. So I wanted to make sure to like show that element. Um, so you see like this is part of her work, but also in one of the um, windows, the kids have both an American and a Dominican flag. Mm. Mm. Oh yeah, and then you see him making the mask itself there in, in that same image up there. Yeah, so you see how he's like, and she's helping to paint it. Mm -hmm. Very good. Any other drawings you want to go? We have time for maybe one more. Um, I, oh yeah, I wanted to show the one where she's talking to her grandmother um, in the Dominican Republic, this one. Yeah, that's uh, fairly early on, is that right? It's yeah, a, uh, yeah, it is. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a beautiful scene. Yeah, look at that. Thank you. Yeah, so I, um, in my research, I, I just tried to learn as much as I could about Dominican culture and um, through like art and literature and, you know, just like um, I read Julia Alvarez's book In the Time of the Butterflies, um, which is about the time of the dictatorship. And I just um, loved how she described the garden and the time that they spent as a family in that space and how it was both like sometimes sinister because you didn't know who was watching from the bushes or it was also like a, a safe haven for the, their family. Um, and so I was inspired by uh, that sense of safety, trying to create this like um, enclosed space where they can like have their own moment together. And I think it's really interesting that although it's not called for, I don't think in the um, in the text, you have cats. Cats are mentioned in the text, but a very strong presence of cats is a sort of foreshadow of one of her uh, the good things going to happen to her soon. So, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. It it all reminds me. I I studied screenwriting, and you know the the dialogue is never supposed to tell the truth because then it's exposition, and the picture is supposed to tell that part of it. So, the interaction of text and story, and how the story magnify how the pictures magnify the text, uh, just really wonderfully illustrated. I think in this book, so it's really Thanks. really terrific. Good. Um, so. Thank you very much. I'm going to now show, go back to another one of our critics and um, we will, uh, in just a second, I think, uh, hold it, yeah, here we go now. Um, it's 
stand with stand by folks. These are uh, very special people for Bianca. This is Jaden and Juliana. Hi, my name is Jaden Diaz, and this is my sister, Juliana. And we're going to review starting, starting over in Sunset Park. Park. Story, Story by Jose Perez and, and Lynn McGee. Pictures, pictures by Bianca Diaz. Diaz. So what I like about this book is the family moves from um, Dominican Republic and from to New York. Um, they, she tries to fit in, but not really. And she feels alone because the people who live by her and on her school, um, they all speak English. So it's hard for her to understand sometimes. So, and some, her cat is like used to the surroundings. And she says that she, that she should be able to get used to it. And it also reminds me of my grandparents who moved from Mexico to Chicago and I think it's a long time. Um, I like all the pictures, um, especially this one. And I love that some words were in Spanish and the rest are in English. And um, I love this picture on the back cover. That's our review of the Grand Open Sunset Park. Bye. Bye. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for an objective and wonderful review there, Bianca. Thank you so much. All right. So, um, we're going to open it up now if you want to unmute yourselves, and uh, we'll open it up for a general QA. Um, uh, we have a few more minutes, and uh, Call on whoever you'd like, or just wave your hand, and I'll try to, to see everybody, and I'll call you. Or if any of our panelists have anything further to say about what we brought up in the course of the conversation. I did think uh, something mildly amusing, uh, and that is that <clears throat> when, when the reviews uh, came out for this book, at least one reviewer said that the narrator is never named. And uh, I remember we read that review and thought, well, that's not true. Her name is Jessica. Everybody knows that. And, you know, just today when I was reading through the story, I am not sure that Jessica's name may have got edited out of the narrative uh, you know, she's, she's in a jacket copy and on the, on the back panel and on the flap copy, but she may have disappeared in the process of transitioning from uh, graphic uh, fiction to a hybrid sort of picture book. Her name might have disappeared. And we, <laughs> the, it, the funny thing is you get so immersed in it when you're working on it as writer and as editor and as illustrator that sometimes you just can't see the forest for the trees. It, it, the, the reviews may be accurate that Jessica's name is never in there. Well, that'll be a great correction for the second printing. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. yeah, I noticed that today myself. I was like, what is the child's name? And I found it in the jacket. I, I didn't find the text, but I didn't look that day. So, anyway. uh, we, they're so real to us as in the process that you know, it's hard to be objective. You know, you're so immersed in the story. I wanted to say that originally, um, when I was thinking about the story, I was thinking of a single mother and her daughter. And I was really thinking about my sister who, who was a single mother. And I have a soft spot for single mothers. Um, and, but then when we, when we fell in love with the setting in Sunset Park, there's such a large Dominican presence in Sunset Park, and that's one of the beautiful things about Sunset Park. It made more sense to go with a mother and a daughter. And then at that same time, children were suffering so much at the border of the United States. And I, I remember that we felt so like torn up by that. And it was so satisfying 
when the book was uh, when 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 the book was picked up by a publisher by Tilbury, it, it was so satisfying because we felt like we had done something that would could maybe reach out to them. And I think also I related you know, to the story because I moved a lot when I was a kid. I loved moving, it was exciting. We lived in fun places, but I remember what it was like to, you know, I went to five elementary schools and I remember what it was like making friends over and over again. And so it's really a story for any kid who feels like they don't quite fit in. I think one of our, one of our astute uh, cr critics mentioned that very thing. She said she doesn't feel like she fits in. And I think that it will, you know, appeal to those children as well. Do you feel like that, Jose, that you also as a child, you know, you moved so much, you have such an international experience of life. Um, but I started moving when I was older. I was 15 when I moved to the States. But yes, I think uh, moving is difficult, especially for children. We always think children can adapt to any environment or any change, but it's not true. Um, it makes you a different person in so many ways. Mm -hmm. So I think you're right. Uh, it's very emotional for children to move to a different country, a different culture, uh, going to school and not understanding what they're saying. That's tough. <laughs> so I hope this book helps them. Yeah. 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 I'm really impressed talking to Jonathan and all of you about with care, um, children's books can really be an instrument for social change and for social support. And uh, I applaud all of you in, um, in your goals and setting out to do that. And particularly for, as you said, children from this part of the world trying to come to the United States at this moment. And it's not, a, the worst is not over for them. It's still terrible. Um, so, um, so thank you and congratulations to you on that. Questions or comments? Um, I'm going to do my best to get the uh, link to book culture into chat once again. So there you go. If you want to get the book there for a child or friend, take a look. It's a beautiful object. I love having it around the house. Uh, Bianca, again, congratulations on, on your great work. Uh, Brad, if I may compliment uh, Bianca. An Ezra Jack Keats Award is no small thing. Congratulations. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, that's impressive. Thanks so much. I know, now I know why you make such beautiful illustrations. <laughs> uh, and for Jonathan's point, Bianca's website shows some of the other work she's doing, which is much of it uh, cause-driven, and it's really inspiring. So do check her out. Bianca, you might want to either put it in chat or give us your website uh, coordinates. Sure. Yeah, I'll put it in the chat. It's pretty easy. It's just my name, BiancaDiaz.com. And I want to really invite people to look at the Tilbury um, Press w website. I'm maybe I can put that in the. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, the book is distributed by Norton, so it's available everywhere. Um, but as you know, we're trying to support a local book a bookstore. So uh, look for it there or ask for it there and they can stock it as well. Any other questions? No I question, it's just a comment. I just want to congratulate you all. I haven't bought the book yet, but it looks beautiful. And thank you, it really is an achievement. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa. I'd like to say one thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I just want to say that I think, uh, I think elementary teachers are going to love using this in the classroom. Uh, I think the illustrations are stunning and I love uh, the bilingual aspect. Um, it's a page turner. And by the way, when you turn the page from the, that rich cat palette to the, um, oh, uh, the Central Park sequence is my jaw dropped. It's stunning. It's just stunning. Van Alsberg and uh, all the great McCloskey, all of them are bowing uh, for the hard work that you've done. Nice work, all three of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. That's my cousin Brady, who's a distinguished English teacher. So that's very high praise. Thank you. Oh, thanks. 
Thank you. Well, yes. Anyone else? All right, everyone. So let's give a hand to our panel today for their great work and their sharing their work with us today. It's really, really grateful to you and good luck to this. This has been a wonderful exploration of a book that will have a long life in the bedrooms, schoolrooms, and playrooms for kids and adults. I'm just signing up on that Zoom thing. I'll be out in just a second. Okay. <laughs> the link to book culture is in chat. You can buy it there. We hope to see you soon. Uh, again, congratulations to Jonathan, Jose, Lynn, Bianca on a wonderful, wonderful book. And uh, Godspeed to all of you. And have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bruce. Thank you, yeah, Thank Bruce, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bruce. That was wonderful. Congratulations so to all. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. We're so glad you're here today. Yeah, thanks for coming, Jenny. I loved it. Yeah, and Meredith and Lisa and Stephen, John and Jerry and everyone. Thank you so yeah. much. Thanks for coming, Mom. Right. Thanks, John <laughs> and Bianca. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you both. Thank yes, you. This is awesome. Jose, I miss you so much. Please come back. It's been a long year. A long year. <laughs> Please come to back. Yeah, Please Jose, come. have a good evening. It's almost dinner time in Madrid now, isn't it? It's 11 p.m. <laughs> <laughs>